Hello, puppies and kittens. So once again, I have gut sick Gibbon on the show, and I'm also, <laughs> <laughs> also known as Erica. Uh, and she and I, it seems, have both debated the same, you know, convicted fraud. And I'm watching. I was watching the debate that you had with what was his name, Cunt. Um, well, we'll just go with Cunt. Hovain. <laughs> Otherwise known as inmate number 0645-2017. Um, and, and one of the things that I noticed was that he's still repeating things that I have corrected to his face multiple times. And he's still repeating the same error. I mean, it's not like he doesn't know that it's wrong. My my thing is, as I know for a fact, in, in both the first debate discussion, interaction, whatever we want to call it, that you had with him on, on non-sec, and then also with, with your back and forth videos, that you have taught him multiple times what a nested hierarchy is, and we're still we're still having that conversation. So, so he does this thing about kinds, right? Yeah. Did, it, did oh. it ever become a new kind? I mean, dogs produce dogs. You know, my farmers everywhere in the world, they, they see the dogs produce, cows produce cows. You know, dogs don't ever produce a fruit fly. Right? So, so he's doing everything he can to deliberately misrepresent this as if he could gaslight so hard that we will forget what evolution is. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. He mentioned to you what percentage of a mosquito is a dog. Yeah. Yes. So yes, let's talk about how, how do you fuck evolution up so bad that you could say something that like that? I mean, I mean, it, you, it has to fall, you know, I would say it's surprising, but this is also the same individual that that seems to forget that artificial selection is evolution and therefore every farmer on the planet relies indefinitely on it. <laughs> so, but he's also redefined what evolution is many times. I've given him the definition. I've given him, I'm shown oh. him textbooks. I've shown him textbooks that provide the definition, but he still comes up with his own straw man to, 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 to tell me that that's what it is. Yeah, that, the rock uh, situation. Yes. Yeah, the, his six levels of of evolution that were where the were like uh, four out of the six were proposed by people who did not accept evolution. Some of who believed, some of the, whom lived before Darwin. Yes. Yes. So, so how could any? How could how could Big Bang cosmology be part of evolution if if the people who proposed that theory disagreed with evolution entirely. I mean, like, look at Fred Hoyle, for example. He came up with nucleosynthetic theory, hated evolution, complete creationist in that absolutely. regard. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, the thing the thing that kills me, too, is that the second that you start to get him, and I'm, I know you, you have been through this many more, you've been through the fire more times than I have with this, but every time you start to kind of, you, you start to kind of quarter him in on a subject, I've noticed that, that he'll divert to one of two things. One, He'll divert it to abiogenesis, which of course is not part of evolution <laughs> at all. <laughs> or, well, I can't defend abiogenesis because I damn sure course. can. Yeah, of course, of course. But the thing is, is that it's like when you sign up for a, a, a debate, a discussion, whatever, um, on evolution, right? We're working with with you know incremental morphologic change uh, based off of genetic change in populations over time. You know, so if we want to have abiogenesis, converse, abiogenesis conversation, I'm with you. I'm down. But we gotta like, you know what I mean? He, he wants to cram so many you know subjects into a single conversation. I know you've said this before, but it's like there's there's more there's more corrections to be made in a single sentence than there are words in the sentence. <laughs> uh, but but it, uh, the second thing I've noticed that he diverts to, and this one drives me crazy, is we'll be talking about, I'm sure you remember this, we'll be talking about, um, you know, the, the genetic difference between humans and chips or, or bonobos, either member of Eunice Pan. And then the second he starts to get a little tripped up on that, he switches it over to, well, do you really believe you're related to a mosquito? Erica, do you believe you're related to a mosquito? Well, yes, Kent, of course I do accept that I am related to a mosquito. That's a very different pre-arthropod split, but let's get back to what we're talking about now. Yeah, on that note, on that note, for anybody who, who ever listened to him and didn't immediately see through what a sham he is, I when we talk about that there's no such thing as a kind, uh, Kent's argument is that you can get a five-year-old and say, is this, are the are these two 
uh, two two things from the same genus are they the same kind okay well yeah there's are this other thing from a completely different phylum is it the same kind well if yeah it, and so a five-year-old will know that but if, unfortunately the 65 year old doesn't know how to answer that question because he can't tell us what a kind is and he keeps referring to his magic book of fables but it doesn't describe what a kind is either you know, because that one that talks about like all kinds of birds, all kinds of birds, and it mentions all sorts of birds too, all sorts of birds of every kind. The fuck are we talking about? How many different <laughs> kinds of birds are there, and what the hell is a sort? I, isn't, I feel like I remember you covering this before, Arn, but I, I correct you'll probably jump in and, and know just what I'm talking about. But isn't it in an, either Exodus or Leviticus? There, there's a reference to to, or at least the per pneumatics, it's the same word for for kind that's referencing like locusts, for example. So it's like, well, if we're talking about locusts, we're getting pretty specific. Well, yeah, Art. the Bible misclassifies everything. It defines things by what they do, not by what they are. And that's right. why the Bible says, and it really does, it says that the that a whale is a fish. Now you've mm. got to compare two different references that are both clearly talking in the same context, but yet, right. when you look at the two together, yeah, the, the, from the Bible's perspective, a whale is a fish. It depends on where you read as to whether bats are birds or whether bats are locusts. <laughs> Swarming things, right? <laughs> exactly. So they are the four-footed grasshoppers. Oh, yes, yes, I, yes, I've heard that one as well. Yeah, and you know, Kent, Kent, I, I have in my notes, because I, I <laughs> by your request, which by the way, um, now I'm realizing is quite mean. I rewatched that debate that I that I had with Kent, and um, he, he sort of starts off his his you know his script by by bringing up the fact that uh, that the, the Bible is of course scientifically accurate. In oh, every... nothing was ever disproved yeah. in the Bible except <laughs> yeah. that showing cattle striped sticks cannot make them produce striped calves. <laughs> every farmer in the world will tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I also I've, I've written quite a lot about how everything, literally everything, the Bible says about the Earth in relation to the rest of the cosmos is embarrassingly stupidly wrong. Yes, I, I'll, absolutely all of those things have been disproved, where, of course, he can't admit that because he worships a book. Well, and you know what kills me is I've, I've watched, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I consumed an inordinate amount of Kent Hovind uh, sort of media prior to my, de my debate. I think you deserve a medal for that, Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen, I partially blame it for, for the light alcoholism that developed while I was still living in the UK. But it it was uh, it was a trip. And I again it was as many as I could. So when I watched his conversation with um Michael from Inspiring Philosophy, I was I was sort of floored by his insistence that this modern English translation, the King James version of a of a very ancient text, is superior and indeed more accurate than the Hebrew that was influenced by other ancient Near Eastern cultures, because that's what humans do. They share cultures and they share stories. And that's why there's so many damn similar things between them, you know? And, and you've got Kent sitting there waving his King James version around, you know, as if, as if this, the King James version of the text is how it was intended originally, which you know he actually does, of course, believe. And, and it was that moment where I, was like, I want to caution. There's a slight difference between when we say believe and when he says believe. If I believe something to be true, true. Right, this is what I think is most likely true or closest to the truth. But when, but when believers say believe, you can put the word make and a hyphen in there. It's make believe. So, so Kent is very obviously trying to make believe. He knows that the things that he's saying are not true. We've gone over the definition of what a religion is. He knows that, that that it does not apply to evolutionary studies. He knows when he went over this thing with you that it's not make believe. That, that it's not it's some you imagine SpongeBob stuff. You're Sponge sitting Bob citing Bob. studies, <laughs> experiments in the lab, and he's arguing that it's imagination. You just cited a list of different fossils and how the and and how, how the theories predict. And he doesn't know what a theory is either because he why the hell would he? But he taught math in high school science for, for you know. In high school, no, taught in church. Yeah, exactly. He didn't have the criteria, the minimum qualifications to teach in any actual high school in the country. 
He could only teach in religious schools where their standards are obviously quite a lot lower. Oh my God. Yes. I mean, you know, I, I can't remember if I told you this prior to when in our previous conversation, you know, but when I, when I was a middle schooler, the, I went to a Christian middle school, which taught young earth creationism. Um, and, and the biology, the biology criteria was so abysmal that when I got to high school, which I went to a good old fashioned public public school, which of course is miles above in, in, in quality. Um, but it, you know, in Indiana, for, for, <laughs> for clarification, um, but it was, it, you know, my, my, my biology, you know, teacher at that time was obviously cool enough and up to date enough that they were like, wait, hold on a second. We need to have a conversation. Um, and, and you're, you're right. Even it's, 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 this is terrible to say, but it's, it's a young earth creationism is like a poison when it's taught in any kind of institution, it seeps into every other, you know, branch of education that's there. Um, and and dilutes it down to a level where it's it's not going to put up a fight against the the central dogma. So on the on the notion of uh, what he was talking about, what degree of mosquito is a dog? Right, where he's <laughs> trying very very hard to to misunderstand this. Uh, the yes. one he brought with me, he didn't bring mosquito and and dog. He he brought uh, pine tree and elephant. Mm, or when uh, it's hard to find a deeper division than between plant and animal. Yes, no, and, but and I'm trying to explain to him what a eukaryote is, and I've gotten into this with a few creationists who refuse to accept that they are eukaryotes because they don't understand what the hell that means. That refers to an organism, not a human. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, word organism still applies here. I, <laughs> but, I, but with I, you, with, when he brought up mosquito and dog. This is a good. This is a good learning opportunity, and then, but part of the reason that, that Erica, by the way, for the audience, part of the reason that, that, that Erica and I are having this conversation is for, for we know that a handful of people have debated this guy and other shysters like him. And just, just what's really sad to see is when a professional scientist goes up against somebody like this, and they're expecting that they're going to be going up against a legitimate person with a legitimate position. Like scientists afford each other some degree of respect because they have some accord to the truth and to facts, but you know, the same thing yes. you know, the truth is what the facts are. So they, and they, then they will correct themselves. If you point out that a scientist has said something wrong, well, that is shame upon his name. He, he said something that wasn't accurate or he said something that wasn't supported. Mm, and yes. how bad is that? Or is it controversial in any way? In which right. case you can't assert it. You can say, well, you know, on on the I don't know. Let's let's say we're we're both anthropologists back in like the sixties or the seventies, and we're arguing brain first or bipedalism first. You know, it's like you couldn't say either one really. You could say, okay, well, I think this because of you know this specimen and whatever. Um, but but you're right because there's well, there's an agreement, a mutual agreement among people involved in science um, that that the criteria for evidence must be at a certain point. The criteria for support must be at a certain point, um, and and you're you're dead right. You know, you 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 have a conversation with Ken Hoven, and you realize very quickly that we are not just dealing with a different criteria for the for the very bottom level, um, but but the stand there's a double standard for science and for for his thoughts on on creationism. You know, you can't, you can't even call him thoughts. These are slogans. He's rehearsed them very well. These are the few things that he knows. I mean, the guy is impressively stupid. Really, he is. But he does have this pat little script that he has stuck to for decades, and he will never correct himself on any of this. But when, when the point I was going to bring up about when he brought up the mosquito and the dog with you, the learning opportunity that anybody else that wants to take on this guy uh, or anybody like him should be aware of, you know, these little learning opportunities, you know, the mosquito and the dog, they're both animals, right? And, and mm -hmm. so, so how far back is their, their common bond and how, how many links, but from the, from the split between plants and animals, how many of these links can we go over to, 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 uh, 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 to say that both of these are, well, actually, we can't say that a mosquito, mosquito is a protostome, not a deuterostome. But you know, you can just you can still go quite a way back, and build up a commonality between these two. So, if you have protostomes go this way, deuterostomes go this way, and out of deuterostomes you get all this lineage, and then out of protostomes you then have all of these, and mosquitoes are at that end, way out there. Why the hell would there be any degree of mosquito in a dog? <laughs> 
of course, but, but the problem is you're not arguing with somebody who wants to understand anything. He doesn't want to understand. He wants to believe. It, absolutely. And I think that's why I've noticed, you know, in both your conversations with him and, and indeed everyone else who's, who's picked up that gauntlet is that at the second right that that there starts to be um, a very visible similarity or divergence. Like I believe, I think you talked with him about uh, canids and bears, right? And then amphicionids. Um, and so the second that it starts to look like, well, wait a second, maybe canid isn't a kind, maybe you have to expand it, you know, the phylogeny challenge, because um, where's that expansion stop? That's when he'll pull out the, hold on, hold on, hold on. Do you believe insert one organism that is supremely distant from something else on the far opposite side of the animal or indeed a uh, kingdom of life in general, what doma opposite domains or whatever, um, to, to, to force incredulity on the audience, right? To, to force it, to, to force the, the followers who are in the room to stop thinking, well, wait a second, holy shit. I think bears and dogs might actually look pretty similar morphologically. And it's kind, it is kind of weird that we find amphicionids before we find either bear or, or dog in, you know, sort of strata. Then he, he resets the, the computer and then they're thinking- My amphicionids for, for the audience, that is referring to an animal that is commonly known as a bear dog, or there are some varieties known literally as dog bears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, forgive me if I if I mixed up which one is is considered to be sort of our our last common ancestor for the two of them. Um, I, I believe it's amphicyon. Okay, yeah, that I had thought that, but again, that I'm not. They're they're not really my my specialty. Um, well, actually, no. It, it wouldn't be fair to say amphicyon. Amphicyon is karyotypic okay. of the larger forms, but of course. The origin of those would have been one of the smaller ones. So, like, um, what was it, Asparacion? I think Asparacion is actually closer. Asper okay, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I feel like I feel like I have at least heard that name before. I'm I'm not as as phylogenetically inclined as you are with the with the grander scale. Quick story about that. Uh, my son, when he was when he was really young, he was criticizing me for doing this thing on YouTube, arguing. Mm -hmm. with believers all the time and he said you know you're not making any money out of it you're wasting all your time why do you even do this why, what do you have this obsession for i took him to a creationism seminar <laughs> oh my god <laughs> where uh, he could listen to one of the guys from the institute for creation research lie to the audience and there was somebody representing evolution there too, but they didn't. But they, but you know they didn't get somebody who's who understands that he's dealing with a flim flam man. He get you get somebody who, who who's used to dealing with scientists who right. expects accountability. Yeah, you're not going to get accountability out of a creationist. That's right. not their game. So my son was livid as he's listening to all this, and he was a, he was a little boy at that point. He was like 14 maybe. And so when the, when the, the thing was over and you get to walk up to, to talk to the speakers, I stood up and I'm going to go after this guy and I'm going to have a meeting of the minds with him. And when I'm immediately surrounded by all these Christians, <laughs> this was many years ago. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm surrounded in this huddle, like tall grass of just all these people trying to, to, to say the stupidest things being like, you know, if we came from monkeys, why is they still monkeys? Really? That, that <laughs> level of dumb. Yeah. Yeah. So nobody noticed my son just fly right through the crowd, went straight up to this guy. And he was, he was a big guy, like six, four or something like that. And, and here's my son shaking his finger. <laughs> and I couldn't get over there because I'm stuck with all these people around me. But it, it, as the, the crowd eventually thins, I see that guy, the, the speaker, right. flee the building. Oh, he, good God. He spoke to no one else but my son and hurriedly dashed out. Yeah, and when he, your son forced the retreat. Now, I noticed that as my son is talking to this guy, he's gathering his own crowd. Sure. So there's all these people standing around. And when that guy fled, he fled in a sweat. <laughs> and people came up and started patting me on the shoulder. Going, like that, right? So what the hell did my son say to this guy? So I finally got to talk to him, and he says that the guy tried to say confusing things to him. I kept trying to change the subject. You never, you never get him to concede an error on any point. Right. They won't. Yeah. They can't. It's part of the. It's part of the doctrine. They have to. They have to switch gears. You know. They. They can't lose a point. So. They, and I'm sure you've seen this before. Like. Yes. Like. Like. What. Like. Um. I remember. This group of Muslims gathered around. And they were. They were. They were arguing about. Uh. uh, um, uh embryology. Hmm. And they didn't realize that the guy that they're talking to is an embryologist. <laughs> 
And so they said, oh, okay, well, let's talk about geology then. Yeah. The fuck? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah so, so consult a geologist, right? Yeah. It, it, so, so this guy, this guy is being, is, uh, is trying to confuse the 14 year old boy who is handing him his ass in a live debate. So he says, uh, he, he demands to say, well, why don't you give me a transitional species then? Or so my son says, Hesperocyon. Right. The guy doesn't know what the hell is Hesperocyon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and he can't concede that, right? So then the son yeah. fired it out, right? And he said, well, you can't give me a beneficial mutation. And so he does. He, my, my son fired it out. And I can't, I can't even remember the top, the, the the collection of letters, you know, CCR5, Delta 32. Yeah, and he, threw out a, he, he threw out a thing like this. It was the one for hyperdense, unbreakable bones. He goes, that's a beneficial mutation, isn't it? Yeah. And the guy's confused because he doesn't know what the hell. So yet, And he can't concede anything. He can't be honest mm -hmm. about any point. It's always got to be obfuscation. It's got to be a, a, a complete smoke and mirror show. Right. And so that's how my son ended up handing him his ass. He left in a sweat and my, my son whooped him. <laughs> what did your son say after that? Did what did his did his Oh he I understood. Know. He understood and, yeah. and it, why I do what I do. And the, the beautiful thing was is I asked him what changed your mind in the in the course of all this. And what got him was when he looks in the audience and while this guy's talking, he sees these little old ladies nodding. And that, that's what threw him. These little old ladies are totally susceptible. They've, they've got no, no, former the form, no formal education. Yeah. They've got no protections against this guy. Yeah. Yeah. So they're well, being completely duped. And, and he knows they're going to they're gonna give his, their pensions away to, the, to his organization. Yeah, the tithing. Yeah, well, and you know that's that's really who who this is for, right? I mean, having these convert having these conversations with guys like you know Kent Hovind um, is is you know in enjoyable for the sake of the discourse, if you can call it that. Um, but but also because there's always the chance. Shut and, up! Like, Shut up. <laughs> well, he's he's just getting excited. Mine I actually had to lock my doors because I'm barging in. Um, but yeah, it's it's for people who who might be in the audience who are who are trying to figure out what's going on and and you know are p potentially even. I mean, I'm sure you've gotten comments like this before. Who are like, man, you know, it might send you a message and be like, well, you know, normally I'm a big I don't know Kent Hovind fan, but like you gave me a lot to think about. And and those are great to hear because then you're like, you know what, that 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 makes the whole thing worth it. Um, I I like I said, I I went to a, a young Earth creationist style middle school. And we had a whole course and, you know, of course, naturally that there's a whole, there's a whole hour of the day for, for like, for like Bible class. Right. Um, and so there was, there was a semester devoted to worldviews, which I'm sure <laughs> I've come to loathe that term. Um, <laughs> and, and of course it was, it was supposed to be several different worldviews. And of course, why young earth creationism was the correct one. Um, and when we were covering you know, of the theory of evolution, which they guised strictly as, Oh, well that's naturalism. It's, it's like a religion. Um, I, I have this distinct memory of, of our teacher getting up there and talking about how, well, there's, you know, you, you might have like Lucy, like some of, some of these Australopithecines. He's like, but there's nothing to link that to any of the other modern humans. He's like, they've never found a Homo habilis. And I remember thinking, well, that's pretty weird that they're saying that they, they have, if, if they have one, I guess, I guess they, they never have. Um, and like the next year I'm sitting in biology, right? In high school. And now my dog has found the chew toy that has the, squeaky thing in it so oh listen it's i know how that goes i believe i've got two golden retrievers they're both nightmares <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah it, and it's that kind of thing where where i pick up a textbook and it's like oh you know homo habilis is listed um and i'm like well i thought they never found that you you give it a cursory google search and you're like oh shit not only is there a single specimen but for the vast majority of these hominids we've got dozens you know, of, of either mostly complete or partials or whatever. And I thought it was a blatant, it was a blatant lie. You know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't like, and then I was like, well, maybe, maybe, maybe the timing's off, you know, but this was back in, I don't know, 2008 or something along those lines. So there was no excuse. And, and so it's for the young kids and it's for the old ladies, you know, it's for these people who are in vulnerable positions. They have no way of even knowing that they're being lied to and they trust authority figures. You know, and, and that's what made me somewhat, I, I think I might be a bit, I have a little bit of bitterness in there because I was like, 
I've always loved science. And even when it was like young earth creationist science, I, I thought it was legit science. So, you know, I, I think about the, the hours wasted and I think about the, the teachers who are in positions of power who can just rain down falsehoods on, on youngsters. And that, that pisses me off, it makes me really mad. That, that, that is another motivation behind it. What the way that I was duped was I was watching pseudoscience documentaries on TV thinking right. that if it's on TV, somebody must have vetted this. Yeah, someone, right. surely. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't just let you let TV lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> surely not. God forbid. Yeah, and then there was, uh, you know, I had friends came back from Vietnam and said they've never trusted anything they've seen on the news since after they saw the way that Vietnam was being reported. Oh, God. Yeah. I remember seeing something similar in the Gulf War where there was a report of a Scud missile that came in through the roof of a house in Tel Aviv, mm. right? Or somewhere in Israel. I don't, it, may, it may not have been Tel Aviv, but I remember it was somewhere in Israel and they were talking about the Scud missile attack had hit Israel and it, this unexploded Scud missile, they were trying to get the people out and the, what they're gonna do about this missile. And then the next, the next day, that never happened. Yeah, erased. To, to hell? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, there was no internet then. Right. This was just regular TV news. Yeah. So what the hell happened to that story? Now suddenly they're telling that that that, that there was never any attack. None, none of the missiles made it that far. Okay. Yeah. So I, I don't. I've learned to be skeptical. Right. To at least some degree. Well, and I think you know I was I was having a conversation um, with with a relative the other day, right? <laughs> Which is always bad practice. And um, th this this relative of mine was talking about how. Well, you know, with fake news so rampant, you, you know, you, how can you really know that, how can you really trust any of those papers that you read? And I was like, well, because unlike general television, right, like most, most technical literature provides a methodology. So if you wanted to, and you had the means, you could go out there and test it for yourselves. Or better yet, if you don't have that ability, plug their data into like R or Microsoft Excel and check the stats for yourself. You know, it's it's the, the beauty of peer review is that you can double check people and, and make sure that what they're saying, I mean, it sucks when someone points out that you're wrong, but even being wrong adds to the body of knowledge. At least you're not wrong anymore. Yeah, exactly, right. I'd rather stop being wrong than still be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so there was this guy that died like a month or two ago named Mad Mike. Okay. Who right. had launched himself up in a rocket that he built. I, I saw this. So I interviewed that guy at once. Really? Time. Yeah, I, I had a conversation with him, and I thought it was very fruitful. He's trying to prove that the Earth is flat mm. by building a rocket that he then goes up. I, I can't remember what his, what his altitude was, and I. But it was funny when I had the conversation with him. I said, you know, um, he, he said that he he didn't trust science, so he's he's building a rocket to prove science wrong. <laughs> Big science, of course. <laughs> and I'm like, you are the example of science because that's what science does. Yeah. Scientists try to prove each other wrong all the time. And so you built a fucking rocket. <laughs> to blast. So, oh, so how many physicists have you proved right when you did that? Right. Yeah. And that, no, the sad thing is, is you're doing this for a, for a, a flat Earth belief, which is so e it's so easy to disprove flat Earth belief on all the, a bunch of different criteria, and your rocket only went up so high. I got to tell you, I was I've been, I've been to the Burj Khalifa. I was on the observation deck. I was taller. I was higher up than you were in your rocket out of an elevator. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you could have done that. You could have. Taking a flight to Cincinnati, you would have been yeah. <laughs> any, any any flight, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere, you know. And and but but it, it was funny talking to this guy and praising him for being critical and for 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 doing exactly that thing where you test those results and you prove and you pr there's a rocket you yeah right. Uh, and then he started, he wanted to back off of the flat earth thing. He said he didn't want to talk so much about the flat earth thing. Well, that's wise. You should <laughs> focus on something you've actually accomplished because there's no future for you in the flat earth thing. Well, and imagine if he took the rigor for, for desiring to disprove us globe heads and like put that towards, I don't know, conventional science. Like <laughs> <laughs> 
study mites or, you know, something that, that you can find just around where you live. Science can be done anywhere by anyone. I mean, that's, that's the cool part about it. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, when I saw that, that this was a conversation about bad faith actors, I thought this is perfect because, you know, I haven't been doing this for very long and, and you have way more experience than I do. And I, I have a lot of trouble because, you, you know, I, I'm coming out of a very early cursory stage of academia, um, but, but everyone kind of gives each other the benefit of the doubt, right? Because we're all looking at the same technical literature and, and we all, like you've mentioned earlier, are, are assuming that we're working under the same criteria for, for support or evidence or whatever, um, particularly because if you're gonna ever publish, you know, you're dealing with people who mostly publish papers and if you've published a paper, you've probably read hundreds upon hundreds of papers just to get that in there of which 50 might be cited. Um, so, so I get into these conversations, you'd all get, I'll get an email or I'll get a comment or, or something along those lines that, that starts off seeming quite genuine. You know, uh, you know, Erica, what makes you think that Lucy was bipedal? Here's an article that says that she wasn't. It's from AIG or, or CMI or, or ICR or something like that. And, um, and I'll be like, okay, you know, like I've, I've got a word document for this because I've had this conversation before. So i Summarize it, send it back. Okay, well, what about this? And, and you know, you get further and further. Never concede that the first point was wrong. Never. Change the Never. subject to something else. Yeah, absolutely. Or or sometimes they'll say, well, I think we'll have to agree to disagree. You know, and, and you're like, on what? On what? <laughs> <laughs> what, are we, what are we agreeing to disagree on? The, the shape of the bones? You know, yeah. like... On the argument I had today is about if somebody accused me of being a liar because every time I disagree with them, I'm a liar. Okay, Apparently naturally. That's, that's the only way I can disagree. Right. right. So so I'm lying about the fact that Noah's Ark was discovered on Mount Ararat. Oh, God. Yeah. So then I'm lying when I say that even young Earth creationists like Answers in Genesis have denounced that. Now I'm lying because I said it denounced it. Yeah. So, so then I have to put up the link. And the quote mm -hmm. where Answers in Genesis says, no, Ron Wyatt did not find <laughs> the ark. On <laughs> Noah's ark has never been found, period. Thank you. See, I'm not lying just because you disagree with and somebody else. Somebody else like last uh, last night tells me you're wrong. That's his post. You're wrong. About what? I don't know. I've never seen anything you've ever said, but I know you're wrong. <laughs> I I. <laughs> So, so I was watching, like I said, I'm rewatching this debate that I had this discussion I had with Kent today, and I'm I'm reading the super chats that are or the, whatever the chat that's popping up on the side, um, and every once in a while, you know, I mean, they're, for the most part, people are pretty cool. Um, even when they disagree with me, they'll be like, "Well, what about blah blah blah?" And it's like, obviously, they're in the super chat, and this was whatever three months ago. Like, I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna dive in and, and get into that. Hopefully, someone else already has. But my favorite is when someone will come up and be like, um, "They're lying." Um, about the data. And I'm like, first of all, what data, w which paper did I present of the dozen that have popped up on the screen? Do you disagree with and why? And, you know, cause you're right. The, it's almost as if <laughs> it's more of a reassurance to the individual making the statement than it is to, to, to anybody who's observing it. You know, yeah, if somebody was telling me that, that the science is not on my side and I said, yeah. oh, I can prove that it is. Yeah. He goes, go ahead, do it then. I said, okay, well, if you say that the science is not on my side, then you are referring to one of several things that I've said in this. So you'll need to specify which thing you're talking about so that right. we know what first to address. And then show me your source for the science that you think is, is taking an opposite position. And that was the guy that said that he has never seen anything I've ever said. <laughs> he just knows the science is against me. How can you say that science is against what I said if you don't know what I said? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's what sometimes I'll look at those and I'll be like, mm, I need a beer <laughs> like before, before we dig in on this one. <laughs> and, and a favorite for me is like I hate when and of course Hoven does this like habitually, just I, as they all do. Yeah. You get into a, 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 any argument with a creationist, and right away they will realize that just how irrational faith is. And now they have to get an, an, an uh, the, the fallacy of false equivalence where they needed to make it seem like you're just as bad as they are. So you have faith too. 
Oh, God. Yes. Oh, my God. Well, at least they realize that faith is bad. <laughs> that's that's something we can work with. So, so Hovind insists on making everything a religious belief. Right. So we can show the evidence that that primed the position. If you have, if you base your perspective on evidence, you'll entertain any possibility, but you will not be convinced of any of them. In other words, you will not believe or adopt a belief in something until you already have the evidence showing that this is most probably true. That's right. you base it on evidence. If you base it on faith then you already believed whatever it was even before you knew you whether you should look for evidence or not. And now you're just looking for justification to rationalize why you you know can believe what you do. Well, and we we might differ in this um, because I this is like a slight small difference, but I when I have well, any differences is 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 unforgivable and you're wrong. <laughs> I know I'll sign off now. <laughs> I, I, I'm of the school that when I've when I've talked with creationists, mostly these are Christians that I've had conversations with in person, um, because it, you know, there's, it tends to be, people are a lot nicer when it's an in-person conversation, myself included. I noticed that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and we're having this conversation and, and I said, look, I have no, I really have no problem if you are asserting that the earth's 6,000 years old and that Noah's Ark was a thing. Um, if you're doing so based off of you, you think it's that way because you, you want to believe that that's, the, the situation. My problem is when you state that, and this is what creationists do more than anyone, that science says, creation science, science supports it. The science is on my side. The evidence says that when, when at least as far as I know, the whole definition of faith is that it is not supported by evidence, right? So wouldn't that kind they of- all argue that. Yeah. And so, so I'm thinking, okay, so aren't you kind of talking about out of both sides of your ass there, right? Because it's like, so the evidence supports it, but it's also faith based, and then also my you think my opinion is is faith based. So I, I tend to to start off with that and be like, look, if you want to you know believe what you want, I, I'm you know it's as long as you're not teaching it in schools, I, I don't particularly care, um, or you're my doctor or something. Um, the, the first thing you do is call out what is the evidence that you're talking about. So when they ask if they they won't ask what my evidence is because I'll just give it. I'll, 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 <laughs> I don't have to make a bullshit excuse why I don't have it. I would just give it. Yeah, of course. It'll be, it'll be absolutely, it'll be actual, factual, verifiable, and indicative. But what they what they do, and and this is this, this will be the thing that caused me to believe what I do in the first place. It's because I didn't believe it until I saw this, you know, or and I didn't believe that other aspect until I found that other thing indicating the next thing in it. But what the faith based belief, they already believe that. There wasn't. It wasn't like they ever happened across a fact that changed their mind. They were originally atheist, and then they saw this fact, and this that fact in place. And if that was the case, they'd tell that story. They would say, "Well, I used to believe this, but then I I found out about this, and I studied that, and realized that you know these things are don't concord." And and it would have to be if it actually is evidence, and it would have to cause me to go, "Hmm, maybe they're right." But that's not what I get. Yeah. When I ask for the evidence, I get excuses that evidence doesn't necessarily have to be factual. Or objective. Or empirical in any way. It can be philosophical assumptions, subjective impressions, logical fallacies, or or erroneous assumptions of authority. Right. And and so so something that kills me too, and this this again was a, in a conversation with a creationist that used to be my coworker, that same one. And um, we were having this discussion, and and I believe his question was. Uh, it, it concerned an aspect of abiogenesis, and it was one of the smaller steps that we don't have quite down. We're still investigating a bit. Um, it might have been, well, I'm not going to speak out of something that's on my field. Um, but but they said, how I can would, you? I, loved, I just want to point that out. We've had this conversation before. It's not your field, so you don't talk about it. Well, uh, yeah. I, I'm, I think I'm, scientists do. <laughs> <laughs> Will roast you if you if you get it wrong. Jackson Weed will get on here and and absolutely bust me if I get a biogenesis wrong. Uh, so well, I, I I had to do a rebuttal video that was where the guy's talking about partly uh, evolution and partly Big Bang cosmology. Right. So I got I I brought in a completely different YouTuber that who's who does all of his his channel is is explaining cosmology. That's all he does. Yeah. You're doing this one, and th that was my collaboration. I'll, I'll handle the evolution stuff after that, but please handle this for me. 
Well, and that's the thing too, um, because it's like either in that situation, right? That was like, King Crocoduck, by the way. King Crocoduck's awesome. His yep. his debate with Hovind is also very legendary. That just the just the just thinking about it is like I can't even imagine reaching that level of of being embarrassed if I if I were Kent. Um, just with the very definite, because I was taking physics one at the time in my undergraduate when I saw that. And I was like, man, I was like, I've taken physics one and, and I at least know the definitions of these concepts. Like I, I, I may not be a, a, a big galaxy brain on it, but I at least know the concepts. Um, but yeah, so, so I'm having this conversation with this guy and, and he's like, well, if you don't know all the steps, you know, why, why do you, why do you accept abiogenesis? Right. And I'm like, well, here's the thing. If just because you don't have a necessarily a single cog in the massive machine, one doesn't necessarily mean it's not heavily supported by other areas. But more importantly, unlike young earth creationism, there isn't a myriad of sources and fields and, you know, probably thousands of papers that preclude the possibility. Because there's a difference between lacking evidence and having evidence that precludes it from occurring. Um, which, which is, this, which is the case with young earth creationism. I mean, I, I, it blows my mind every time I hear the, the name Walt Brown or the, the concept of catastrophic plate tectonics, you know, and, and, and it genuinely gives me heartburn when, when, when it comes up, but. One of the things that the people that are there watching this video, most of them will not appreciate at all is that, you know, you're, you're a science student, I'm a science, we're, we're do both taking primatology courses, for example, I mean, and, and I'm doing, um, you know, as I mentioned, I'm currently, I don't know what else you're taking at the moment, but right. I've been taking archaeology and anthropology and a number of different things. And all of them are heavily dependent on, on evolution and, and explain many different aspects of it. People like Kent Hovind have no idea that they don't know how much they don't know. The, the papers that we read that that continuously vindicate other papers we've already read with additional studies and they all correlate. And there's no other way that all of these things could correlate. We've been, you, you've been, have you been on a fossil dig? Um, I have been to Olduvai Gorge and there was a, there was a, an exploration or uh, an excavation going on there while I was there. Um, but I was visiting in 2015. It was just like a two or three day thing that, that we got to be around and observe. So I've, I've not been on a dig myself. Okay, well, if you've ever found fossils out on your own, you yeah. know, then, then it's it's kind of hard to deny that fossils exist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you found there was a guy here in in, in my hometown uh, who was a he was a, a young Earth creationist school bus driver mm. who went down to the, the creek down the street from my house and accidentally discovered where a, a recent rain had washed out and and exposed a mosasaur. Oh my God! So he he discovered and he he told his granddaughter about it, and the granddaughter reported it to the paleontologist at the museum, and now there's this you know there was, it was this huge dig this was two or three years ago. But the thing is, is he discovered this, and he said he didn't believe in dinosaurs. Oh my God! So how do you go from that perspective to finding the thing yourself? Uh, who was the fraud? Who who is the who is the fraudster? <laughs> yeah, and you know that's yeah that's that's the thing. I the the professor that led this this trip this annual trip to Tanzania. It was about a month. It's about a month long ish. Um and and it's called ecology and evolution. Um and uh, and sort of of Tanzanian African wildlife and things things of that nature. And he told us this story before we left about a, a young man who had gone on the trip two years prior, who was a young Earth creationist. Um, he, he, I think he was a biology student. And so he was coming in on the ecology side of that. He was a freshman. So, you know, he hadn't taken to too many courses yet. Um, and, and he tells us the story about how they arrive at Old Divide Gorge, where you, you literally can't throw a rock without hitting a hand ax just sitting in the ground <laughs> um, and, or, or some kind of, you know, petrified root structure. And um, he said that, that they arrived at Old Divide Gorge and he, this guy who'd been super bubbly and, and fun the entire time and been like, you know, jokingly asserting his worldview and things like that. And, and the, my professor was like, I just kept saying, oh, just wait till we get to Old Divide Gorge. And after that, he he was quiet for like two or three days, like very reserved. And after that, he said that, um, he said that, yeah, the student came and he approached me and and he genuinely wanted to have a conversation. Um, and, and he was like, and it occurred to me that until that point, until he had opened his mind himself to, to the possibility of, of, 
you know, and it's this entire world of science that he had just put up a mental block up for that nothing could penetrate. Um, all of a sudden he was, he, he was available for, for this conversation to take place. It wasn't just like throwing, you know, tomatoes and seeing them slide down the wall, you know, there, there it was open and, and he was willing to, to learn, I guess, as, as silly as it sounds, because that decision has to be made by the individual, I think. Um, no amount of brute fact is going to, to get through to, to, to someone if they don't want to be gotten through to, unfortunately. I uh, have an offering that I would prove for decades now. I've been offering that, that I can prove evolution to your satisfaction uh, in just a handful of, uh, I think it's the maximum I've ever had is like in a couple of dozen mutual exchanges because I wanted there to be a time limit. Because I know that, that that religious people will like badger you forever and then you know, like a hundred emails a day and there'll be five thousand words long each and it'll keep going for months. But but I'm not gonna do that. I'm not wearing you down. I'm gonna keep a limit and it's gotta be done within this time. If I don't prove my point within this time, then I lose. Mm -hmm. and, and the only way I can win is for you to admit that I made my point. Right. Unless you default, you know, if you bugger off or <laughs> If you if you refuse to if you repeatedly refuse to answer direct questions, which is what the way this usually goes. So I had somebody on uh, League of Reason forums a couple of weeks back who accepted my challenge. It's been a while since somebody accepted the challenge, and I said, "Okay, well, uh, let, let's go through some basics." And I, you, you accept this, you accept natural selection, sexual selection. Uh, we, we go through this, this list of things. You accept speciation happens and all of this. And, and I've gone through the entire list of, of all the basics and he's accepted every one of them, hmm. the entirety. Okay. And then says he doesn't agree with evolution. I said, what's left? What, what else did you think there was here? that you didn't need to, that you didn't agree with. We've got this. What else is there? And I never got another post from him. Hmm. I, I guess he just didn't realize he, he'd given up everything. Right. In the very beginning and then had left nothing left, nothing yeah. else. Yeah. Now, Hoven did the same thing where he accepts speciation, but he doesn't realize that speciation is in the macro evolutionary category. Yeah. Not micro. Yeah. Yeah, I... I... I've, I've seen you do this with Kent and, and I had to do this with my friend in real life. Um, and, and it's essentially like you have to really, really point out the fact that the definitions they're using just aren't the definitions. Like they're, they're just not. <laughs> Show me your source for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll be having this conversation. I'll be like, okay, well, well do you accept the, that exact thing? You accept speciation. Well, it depends on what you mean by speciation. Okay, well, you know, speciation in literally any context where there's, say, reproductive isolation across a long period of time or significant genetic divergence, whichever definition we, we want to use, you know, gave a couple of, of examples of, of sort of minor speciation that we've, smaller organism speciation. So you, so you expect, you accept peripactic, periapactic, allopatric. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get, I get all those. Okay. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, well, that's macroevolution. And then they, you'll usually get something like, well, that's kind of a loaded term. And then it's like, no, it's just the term. That it's just the term. I don't know how, how many times have you had to refer people to Berkeley, uh, Berkeley University's Evolution 101 so to get the basic definition when they tell you that that's not what evolution is. Or my favorite, that's not what evolution teaches. Yeah. <laughs> because I kept my library of textbooks. And in one of the videos to Kent Hovind, I read them. Yeah. <laughs> the descriptions. This is what evolution actually teaches, not remotely anything like what Kent Hovind says. Yep. And and a, another classic thing that in, in my conversation with Kent that he did is he'll say something along the lines of like, yes, I get it. Um, but, you know, actually, the specific example he was using was, well, you don't know any of those fossils had any babies. You know, and then he'll say something along the lines of like, I get that what you guys say is that, uh, you know, you've changed it now. So it's not no longer that, uh, sp you know, you don't say species evolved. Now you say populations evolved. And I wanted to be like, Kent, that wasn't a change that was made based off of something you said. That's just been the definition. And you finally caught an on, you know, <laughs> you, you, you've finally gotten it. Like there's finally been the click. They, but, but in his mind, right, it can't ever be 
that he was incorrect. It was that the definition changed because Dr. Kent Hovind, you know, really just forced the hand of the evolutionists. And, I can't believe you said doctor. I <laughs> Yeah, the, the guy who ordered away from a mail order catalog. If there are any Kent Hovind followers uh, watching this, note that uh, he he made a four. I had to do a four part response to the overblown reply that he did to the, to the first video in, in our our, uh, it, our in our back and forth our interaction. So the first four out of seven videos concerned what he was calling personal attacks against him, where I showed that he was legitimately convicted on all 58 counts of various types of fraud. <laughs> where, where, I show, where I showed that the education credentials that he claims are completely bogus. You know, you know, things like that. So I did four videos like that. And then the subsequent three, the remainder of the seven, were my three examples of evidence that I had given. So this is where I'm going to rebut him on that. So it's it's the part, I think it's my part one uh, uh, response, part five, six, and seven. Hoven did responses to the first four, but once I got to the evidence, suddenly he pretended he didn't know that they existed. Mm. He, never, he never said it. So I will put links to those videos below. If you're a Kent Hovind subscriber and you think he had any point at all in that, watch the three videos he was afraid to address and that he didn't want you to know existed. All right, Erica, I'm sorry. This is supposed to be your platform. <laughs> oh, no, please. I, I, I'm glad we have solidarity in this because, I, you know, again, I my conversation with Kent was rather cordial. Um, he was much... I mean, you were much too kind. <laughs> Listen, I I'm hard again. I'm a hard person to rile. I'm a hard person to piss off. Um, and and I I was kind of primed for this with this this year of dealing with someone who was very similar um, in person, uh, who I actually grew to to be decent friends with over the course of. And then and then that's that actually made me even angrier at sort of big C creationism in general because I was like, this guy could have been a great advocate for science, um, and and he's not because of because of his indoctrination and how many other people are there out there who who potentially could be I don't know but um yeah my my conversation with Kent I it was it was enjoyable um if if a bit painful kind of like a good workout um but what I got a perverse pleasure out of that debate I was enjoying it way too much <laughs> 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 you, you really, you really have to. Um, at least with with me, I was really, I really, I had to watch myself a couple of times because I was like, yeah, you know, I, I was, I wanted to keep things chill because I know Kent can be with. I've heard at least that on modern day debate, sometimes he gets his feelings hurt a little bit and then won't come on for a while. So I was like, I don't want to be responsible for, you know, pushing Kent off off of the the, the last platform he has. <laughs> But we were, um, or maybe I do, but he brought up too, um, and, and we're having this conversation, right? It's the end of, of sort of the, the debate. And I bring up Italian wall lizards, right? Because it's a it's a great example. It's it's a classic. Um, the sequel valves? Yeah, the sequel yeah. valves, right. It's, it's and head morphology and, and, and diet and behavior and a lot of really cool stuff. And I was shocked to know, I actually was very surprised that, that he straight up just has not, heard of, of the Italian wall lizards. And I was like, how, I was thinking to myself, I was like, how is it possible that he's been doing this for this long and has never heard of them even on a cursory basis? Like even Answers in Genesis at least has like a page devoted to, <laughs> to why that's not evolution or whatever, whatever the hell they are up to over there, probably exactly that. Um, and I was like, oh my God. I was like, it's because that paper, while not necessarily recent recent, at least was in the 2000s, and the literature searching for Kent probably stopped back somewhere in the 80s, you know, and, and so it's just not on the radar. It's why the Piltdown Man gets brought up every single time and Neanderthal brow ridges, which grow as you age, get brought up every single time. But but nothing recent, nothing new. Yeah, I would have loved to have called him out uh, when he when he made that comment that uh, many cavemen have been proved to be frauds. Uh, <laughs> no, they have not. And he said that not one has ever been proven to be intermediate. 
intermediary, intermediary. Well, no, yeah, literally hundreds of them actually have. And I would love to call him out on this because he's got no scientific documentation because then it becomes the big conspiracy. Well, of course, you're not going to be able to find any peer reviewed research that supports what I'm arguing because, you know, He's full of shit. That's that's why there's not going to fun. It's like those giant skeletons that the Smithsonian is like keeping on the down low. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> so one one lizard would be fun to tell him about. Remember that yeah, Kent Hovind is the guy that said that dinosaurs are literally big lizards. I I I remember. You in, in one of his seminars, he said that, that Jackson Senegal. That lizards grow all their lives, and consequently, if you have enough off oxygen in the atmosphere, or if, or if animals had 900-year lifespans, then Jackson Senegal would grow up to be a triceratops, oh my God. which doesn't really explain how we have fossils of baby triceratops. It but <laughs> let's ignore that for a moment. And I tried to point out to him, but of course, he can't correct Anything he got wrong. Everything he says is wrong, but he can't correct any of it. But if, if you want to bring up a lizard to him, I think my favorite would be the New Mexico whiptail lizard. Oh, the parthenogenic ones? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because it's an entirely it's an entirely clone species. And it, it, they're all female, of course. Mm -hmm. And the in order to do their reproduction, they can't just reproduce whenever they want to. As you know, they don't just have like a regular monthly ovulation. They have to have a mock courtship. <laughs> they have to have lesbian lizard sex. <laughs> I was gonna say, <laughs> Kent, Kent would be sitting at home adding lesbian lizard sex to his list of post fall like. <laughs> You know, consequences. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I mean, and Kent, Kent is a different kind, right? In pun intended, Kent is yeah. a different kind of of creationist because I've had conversations with like Standing for Truth and Raw Mad, and recently I had a conversation with G the G Man, um, which was, you, you know, you had a conversation that's possible with G Man. Listen, you say that, but I, I had a fun time talking with G Man. Oh, I had fun talking to him. I just never would qualify it as a conversation. He was remarkably, he told me he went full G-Man. I don't believe it because we did make it to the end of the conversation. And at the end, he was like, I had a good time talking. And I was like, I did too. And he actually answered some of the questions. It was on Modern Day Debate. It was uh, a couple, either last night or the night before. Um, but I, I bring that up because there's, you've got G-Man and Kent are kind of in the same group, right? They're, they don't really bring up specific science, um, even creation science, quote unquote. But like standing for truth and like raw mat, they've got a lot of stake in like you know replacing Darwin, the Nathaniel Jensen fiasco. That no. yeah, you know you know Nathaniel Jensen. He's the guy who um never heard of him. You're gonna have a ball. <laughs> you're gonna have a ball. <laughs> him and Tompkins, you know the guy who who came out. Um, Jeffrey Tompkins works for AIG. He came out with uh. This this number right? He comes out and says, uh, actually, uh, actually, it turns out that um, humans and chimpanzees are are only eighty five percent similar." And so, Evograd, who's this, um, or actually, it might not have been Evograd. It was it was someone online who's an evolution biology student. Downloads the programs right and and follows Tomkins's exact methodology, and he keeps getting right that. Um, he keeps getting 99 or 98.8 or 95 or 96, very high percentages. For 98. 6, I think. Well, there's two different ways and people need in the audience need to understand that the reason that there is a discrepancy is there's two different ways of reading these numbers. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, you've got your, your general genomic comparison and then coding base pairs. So coding base pairs is way higher than general by like, it's like three or four percent. So this guy, he, he comes out and he's like, well, you know, Jeffrey Tompkins, Dr. Tompkins of AIG, why am I getting really high numbers? What's going on? So a little bit of investigation goes down. And first it comes out that that Tompkins is using a bugged version of BLAST. Like he's just using a buggy version of the system. And he's a geneticist. And he didn't realize that he was using a buggy version of the system. So problem number one there. But problem number two is that when he was comparing like, like sections of the genome, if there was a single like base pair off, it would immediately become a 50-50% comparison, right? It would immediately go down to 50% to similar um, because then obviously everything would be off after that. 
And I'll, I'll send you a link that you can put in the description because there's this excellent teardown of, of, of one, his technical paper that he released, and then someone else who provides their methodology, like, step by step next to Jensen's. And exactly why, you know, every time you see, even with you get when you get in with the, the technical, quote unquote, creationists, there's still so many issues that, that are overlooked. There's data, glaring data omission all over the place. You, you know, Jackson Wheat, obviously, he um, he and RJ Downard released uh, a, a book called The Rocks Were There <laughs> as a zinger on Answers in Genesis recently. Which reminds me, I believe I was supposed to do an interview with him to promote that book. I need to thank you for, I, I need to get back in touch with him now that I'm back in the States and say, I'm back in the States. <laughs> 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 We could do that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a cool text, and and RJ and Jackson basically went through. I mean, you can't fit it all in a single text because it's. I think it's like a one for one with the Answers Research Journal or whatever that AIG, whatever bullshit AIG puts out. Um, and and it's it's a great resource. I recommend if anybody out in the audience likes that kind of thing, it's it's great for that. Um, but but they get really into the data omission, and I think you would appreciate it because there's so much, especially like Georgia Purdom does it quite a bit as well of AIG fame, where it's just like if it doesn't work, they kick it out. Nathaniel Jensen, when he was trying to get his um, his mutation rate, because right, he's he's basically looking at mitochondrial DNA and trying to prove that that mitochondrial Eve lived six thousand ish years ago. Yeah, I was reading a paper today that that called that, and what was it? it it was some kind of egregious error because yeah. it was supposed to be a range, the, the, the highest and lowest. You're supposed to get a moderate in the middle. And um, I, I can't remember the way they described it, but I remember just saying that they, they, they came up with a figure that if you do it really, really wrong, it could be so far off base as to be 6,000 years. Right. And and the problem was two, two very quick ones. One, to get his mutation right, he used dyads instead of triads, which you require a mother, a daughter, and a grandmother to get like an accurate germline mutation rate. Um, and if you have a dyad, it, it can always be somatic. You, you don't know for sure. Um, but more egregious is for his generation time, right? He needs a really short generation time, even with that completely off-base mutation rate um, to fit it into 6,000 years. So he goes to this 1970s paper on average age of birth in Central Africa, and he finds that 30% of people, 30% of young women were like between the ages of 15 and 18 when they gave birth. 30% of those surveyed, mind you. So he just uses 15 as a generation time. He uses the lower end of a 30% figure as the universal for the entire technical paper. And you're looking at that and you're like, Oh my God, you would lose tenure. Like as impossible as it would be, you would lose tenure if you put trash like this out into the world. Yeah, I got a, I got, I got a quote from that paper because I still had it on screen. Yeah, I've been monologuing for long enough. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, another problem in pedigree studies specific to mitochondrial DNA is the distinction between full homo uh, homoplasmic mutations and initial partial or heteroplasmic mutations. Uh, Bendel et al. 1997. Such problems can lead to a considerable error implying, for example, an implausible age of only 6,000 years for the mitochondrial ancestor of all modern humans. And but I just happen to have that paper still on screen because it's part of my homework right now. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's perfect. And, you know, you see stuff like this and and it, it blows my mind that there are people out there taking the time to write technical papers, right, for creation science, only to have, like, your average geneticist, who, who might not even be that great of a geneticist, right, give it a once-over and be like, oh, well, here's your problem. Like, you're you're just doing genetics wrong. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. You'll get what you want. You just have to do it wrong. <laughs> like, so you have all these different independent fields of study, many different ones. I mean, we, we, when we're talking about just just the morphology, the fossils, and then the the geochronology, you know, I mean, because yeah. they're contrary to what Hoven said, you know, there are a handful of places where the entire geologic column has been verified to exist, the whole thing, and and it's not all exposed in one place. Right, you have to drill for it because that makes sense. <laughs> if you're going to have the whole if you're going to have the whole column, it can't be it can't have been whittled away around to make a nice. Cylindrical yeah. column. That's you can make a cylindrical column <laughs> by drilling a hole in the ground, and you can get it that way. 
Uh, so he, he denies that all of that happened. So you have all of these different methods. And I, I need to do a video soon. I really do. I need to make a video soon about all the different methods of dating the earth that people have used before they came up with radiometric dating. Yeah. And then all of the different types of radiometric dating after that, which provide absolute dates. Mm -hmm. So when you have all of that together and then they come up with, with DNA and then when you get mitochondrial DNA and then Y chromosome DNA and you're able to, to, to find these markers on different genomes for the, to clock the human migration on top of getting the genome for every other animal and verifying that the same thing applies to all of them. Well, now we've got, it's, it's stunning how many different things overlap to all paint the same picture. It's, it, it really, it really, really is. And for me too, one of the, one, again, in my chat with G-Man, what I brought up with him was I was like, do you not find it incredibly convenient that using molecular clocks, right? You, of course, the most recent methods, because, you know, sometimes things can get wonky when you go back, but they seamlessly fit with the divergence states. Now, of course it is a range, but it's, coincidentally never within 6,000 years. It's it's always a, a range that matches up and, and overlaps heavily, and it's always millions of years old, um, if not hundreds of millions. Well, it depends on what you're talking about, because there are some things in anthropology that only go back a few hundred thousand years. True. Yeah. Uh, recently, they discovered the genome for Homo antecessor, which is another paper that I'm writing about right now. Mm. Uh, and that's only 800,000 oh, 800, years old, but that's that's the original DNA Right. It's probably the oldest DNA sample that's ever been retrieved. They never got it from dinosaurs. Yeah, let's be, <laughs> let's be very, very painfully clear on that. Nor, by the way, did we find spongy red blood cells. <laughs> <laughs> Wet yep. and oozing when you pulled them out of the bone, just like a like a fresh, a fresh slab of, of ribeye, right? Like <laughs> Yeah, it it you know um the thing for me is like I will I will always when I'm having conversations with creationists I will be like now let's be really clear in conventional science a lot of this requires a ton of time and the reason it and then they're like oh wait but how can you prove that that much time has elapsed and it's like well coincidentally the radio metro radioactive decay decay law is just a law of physics and it's a relatively simple equation that they teach high schoolers how to do. Um, and, and what kills me with that too, is when they start being, well, how do you know, uh, that, that, you know, the, the, the parent material started off completely in favor of the parent? Well, because we can do isochron dating, which makes no presumptions about the parent material. Well, how do you know that, you know, radiation hasn't been accelerated? Well, because we'd all, we, you know, the earth would be a molten ball of, of just hellfire if you tried to cram 4.8 billion years of radioactive decay into 6,000 years or, you know, whatever, half a million. It doesn't really matter. And they figured uh, that out in the 19th century. Exactly. <laughs> and then, then they get, then 2000, whatever, year 2002 rolls around and they get the best and brightest creationists out there. Your Snellings, your Woodmaraps, you know, the big, the, the alpha chads of the creationist community. And they send them out there to go disprove radiometric dating. And then in 2005, they come back, the whole, the rate team, right? They come back and and the the direct quote from Woodmrap is like, we're gonna have to assume some exotic solutions or or hope that something comes along in the future because there's no way to speed it up that we know of right now. And that's the guys who make the money off of this stuff. Even they know. So importantly, before they had radiometric dating to give actual ages, because one of the, one of uh, Hovind's arguments is that everything is circular. You know, you 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 date the the fossil by the rock and the rock by the fossil because he you because know, he doesn't understand relative dating versus absolute dating or radiometric dating. And and that you know, relative dating you can tell an index fossil implies that 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 this strata is older or younger than this other strata that's really all that that's good for is to give you a ballpark of what you're talking about i know that if i find a trilobite in the ground that i'm not dealing with cretaceous rock right trilobites are, are paleozoic mm -hmm. so it's got to be somewhere in that range but <laughs> so that's what the relative dating means now when i do when i find say a uh, a volcanic ash and I can, I have something now that I have magma that I can, uh, that I, uh, that I can date, then that'll come back and it'll, it'll show an actual age in terms of years mm. and because you can't get, you know, a relative dating doesn't provide years. 
radiometric dating provides years. And now we know how old that is. Hovind knows that. They all know that. But they have to keep telling the same lie that they know is a lie in order to deceive those who donate. Well, you're right. I mean, and the thing is, is again, I, I really, I really genuinely try to give people the benefit of the doubt with that kind of stuff. I always try to go with it. Oh, well, maybe they don't know. But again, after consuming an inordinate amount of Kentoven media, there's just no way that that is, I mean, it, unless it's just a, to the degree that it's like a pathologic in one year out the other, then it's intentional. And those are the only two options at this point. Well, he still says that, you know, that evolution teaches that you came from a rock. <laughs> Even though I, I pointed out to him multiple times, <laughs> no evolution textbook, no evolution professor, nothing ever purporting to teach evolution ever said that we came from a rock. And in fact... The earliest organism, even the, even the latest excuse that he heard, and I think he did this one with, with you, was what he said that the earth is a rock. And so now he wants to say that all life came from the earth. But we know that these earlier materials actually rained down from space. They didn't come from here. Right. And so the, the earliest organisms didn't even have minerals in them. And if there's no mineral in it, then it can't be a rock. It needs to be a solid crystalline structure to be a rock. <laughs> and and no part of, of, of that has anything to do with the early formation of life. None of it. So there's not, it, it, he cannot defend that lie. And he knows he can't defend it, but he's going to keep saying it anyway. Yeah. And the same that he does for quite a few different things. He'll, as we said earlier, with, with a nested hierarchy, right? Like he'll correct himself and he'll say, well, I know that, uh, you know, people have been... Uh, and now they've changed it and they got me saying that uh they, they say that they you know don't come from a rock but uh what really happened you know is a, a lot of weathering happened and and uh, then there was a primordial soup and then you came from the soup so really it came from the rock you know and something along those lines um the, and, no and point. <laughs> yeah, exactly he's like uh, you, you really want to believe you came from uh, a soup in the water really do you really <laughs> believe it? yes kent I, we really got to clarify some stuff <laughs> Oh man! So do you have a, do you have any notes for things that in your conversation with him, or or that anybody, if anybody was going to be debating him, or any other professional creationist, because they're all scam artists, mm. that they have to be. I've said this in my book many times that that they, that they know what lies they have to tell at what cue, and yeah. they know that they are lies, but they're going to tell them anyway, because this is all about make believe. It's not about an honest understanding. It certainly isn't about improving understanding. It's about maintaining deception. It is defending the faith. And I've gotten many admissions that they will lie to defend the faith. Yeah, it's and it's that very particular version of it too. I mean, it's and and I do have a couple of of notes that I would at least suggest other people in the future kind of emphasize. Um, but but you know, Kent does the same thing that obviously all all the creationists do, which is they they equate. Um, their version, like they make it like what God's word, man's word, the the whole thing with AIG, when what it really is, is a small sect of people's interpretation of a very ancient text versus conventional science accepted by the vast, vast majority of not just scientists, but people in general. Let's, uh, let's, let's, be, let's be realistic about that vast majority. <laughs> it's all of them. Right. It, it, it's if 99 and 44 one hundredths represents pure as it does in the silver trade, then it is the entire global scientific community. Because only of all the earth and life scientists, the reports that I've the surveys and such that I've seen, at best, 0 0.14 or 0.014 percent of earth and life scientists give any credence to creation science. In other words, Georgia, whatever and her name is, and Andrew Snelling, and and like four others. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the entire body of 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 Chris that's it. right there at AIG. Out yeah. of hundreds and hundreds of scientists in many different disciplines, that's it. Right, and you'll notice too when they, you know, in my chat with G-Man, he, he provides this video of, of people who are, the, whatever, it's like a AIG style video where it's like, here's a list of scientists who have signed the petition that say they doubt, uh, you know, whatever, Darwinism. 
And um, and they're flashing scientists across the they don't, street. Don't even say that they're, they're, they're skeptical. Yeah, yes. Well, what uh, scientist isn't going to say that it, they're skeptical? You're supposed to be skeptical about everything. Well, and here's the kicker. They're flashing people across the screen in very quick succession. But if you pay attention to the bottom of the field that they're in, it's almost all engineers of some sort for the first part. And then the ones that it's not, it's all molecular biologists. So if you're going to ask a molecular biologist if they're skeptical about a abiogenesis, right? Well, you're right. What part? If you get someone who's who's not a big fan of RNA world, then they might be like, well, yeah, I'm skeptical because they're teaching RNA world and I don't agree with it or whatever. You know, I, I, Although, I, to be honest, it's hard to it's 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 hard to go against RNA world anymore. It is. It is. It, especially with um with with all of the recent there was a recent paper on um uh what the earth would have looked like pre Ediacaran as far or rather early Archean, mid Archean. Um, and it's, it's like a total water world. So warm little pond is like already out of there. You know, it's, whatever's happening would probably have to happen quite deep. Um, which if I remember correctly, RNA world is they're, they're, they're they typically pin it with the hydrothermal vents, don't they? Well, it's not just in one location. Okay. I mean, what I know about abiogenesis, and again, it's not my thing either, but what I know about abiogenesis is that there are multiple completely unrelated processes and some of these occur in different environments. Okay. So you have you have an increasing complexity where where something has has already undergone through this process and then eventually ends up in this th that construct now ends up in this environment where this other change happens. Right. And then it and then there's this other thing that goes through this other process in this other environment of the then two meet and if there's this right phosphate under these conditions and if there's a repeating cycle of inundation irradiation and dehydration and then the phosphate arrives it's it's like that. Right. And and you know for those of you out there who are inevitably thinking wow, that's that's complicated. One, it is, because <laughs> I certainly don't understand it as well as Arden does. It's but, biochemistry. Yeah, it's stupidly complicated. It's so hard. But, <laughs> but there's an important point to that. The, the, the fact that biology is so unnecessarily complicated yes. is indicative of its haphazard con uh, uh, configuration. It's very Rube Goldberg. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, if, if, if when you're in uh, when you're high school or you're like beginning college and you study um, uh, photosynthesis, oh god, you, well, they start giving you the if you're like, why would anyone design anything to be so ridiculously convoluted as this? This makes no sense. Simplicity and efficiency are indicative of intelligent design. Complexity implies quite the reverse. Yeah, it's especially too when when so many of these sort of complex mechanisms that we see, you can find simpler, less rigged versions of them in more basal organisms. And then you're like, well, wait a second. <laughs> Are you telling me that, that what we have is a rigged version of what they have? And the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we've spent... Uh, quite a while longer, actually, than I than I intended to have this conversation, and I still never got to your notes. Oh yes, yes. Um, I'll be brief. No, you I, don't. You don't have to. Just go with it. Yeah, sure. Um, let me pull. Let me pull this up here. Okay, so for those of you who for those of you who have conversations with Kent in the future, as I'm sure people will, although I have heard that he has amped up his <laughs> his requirements for for engaging in a debate with them that to a degree that some might not be um, comfortable doing. Um, but emphasize he's, he's demanding money. <laughs> no, no, he's he's requesting that people like give full names and things like that. Um, I gave him my full name and suddenly <laughs> it wasn't good enough. He started calling me somebody else's name instead. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> yeah, Larry. Who the fuck is Larry? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of those things too where when he'd say it, you'd be like, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> you want to be my guest. Um, but one really hammer... Bearing in mind, bearing in mind that Kent Hovind is the guy who, who said two or three weeks ago that sure, some four to seven year old child drowned while at his completely unsafe farce of a park. Sure, some kid drowned, but the rest of the family had a great time. I, I, 
my jaw dropped when I saw that. I was like, <laughs> wow. That, <laughs> wow. Like that, that's some sad, that's a level of mishandling that I didn't even think was was possible. And you would think a guy in hot water as uh, who's so consistently in hot water as, as Kent would be more, more careful, but whatever. I mean, you talk about them having a blast in the gravel pit all the time. So I'm sure the safety standards are up to par. Um but yeah, for, for those of you who debate Kent in the future, I I would first say bring plenty of aspirin and, and patience. But also I would say Kent, I don't think, has a very firm understanding of genetics at all. Um, but simplified hey. genetics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I think I think very simple genetics really can can get the point across to the audience that that you're sort of speaking to. Um, and also it kind of busts Kent publicly. Like when, when, you know, I wrote down in my notes when I was, when I was rewatching this afternoon, um, and, and I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna kind of pull it up here because I thought it was so funny when I was pressuring him on why it's okay for a paternity test to link me with my father, but it's not okay to use the exact same method, albeit more complicated to compare humans and other, other hominoids. He gave me five analogies um, and I asked five times. The first one was on cars. The second was on Microsoft Word. The third was on books. Then there was books again. And then there was the movie, The Green Mile. And essentially the point is, Kent is incapable of answering that question. He he won't even try it. And, well, and he did accuse you. He said people can look at the at the same evidence and come to the wrong conclusion, which is in fact what he has, de has demonstrably done, except exactly. that he hasn't looked at the facts. And he doesn't know what the evidence is. Right. He started with the wrong conclusion, and he's going to stay there. Well, and it's not just that, but he, he brought up the Green Mile for the express purpose of being like, for, for those of you who haven't seen the Green Mile, it's it's like a crime movie. There's there's You should see it if you haven't. It's actually a great film. But, um, it, you know, his whole point was, well, uh, you got this guy who's been uh, accused of a crime, and, and it certainly looks like he did it, but he didn't do it. Um, and so sometimes things don't look as if as if they seem. Yeah, and, and in this movie, the guy had like some kind of magic powers. Right. Yes. I mean, it didn't really have to be that dramatic. It's just you know, it it could just be that he's in America and he's black. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Especially in that time period. Yeah, I mean, the odds weren't exactly stacked in in John Coffey's favor in the first place, unfortunately, and things have not changed as much as I wish they would have since then. Um, but. You know, with Kent, with that, that kind of situation, I was like, look, in the Green Mile and in real life, the only reason we know that someone's been falsely accused of something is because new information comes to light. That's the whole point. You can't say that genetics doesn't indicate relatedness unless new information comes to light to suggest that, which it won't because this has already been concretely tested over and over and over again. This is something that that is so certain it, it holds up in court. Every court in America would hold the paternity test up. Yeah, it, this is the only way you can get, you, you, it's, it, it's the only kind of evidence that this one evidence alone can get a death sentence. Yeah. But the, the, one of the problems that you have with dealing with, with him or with anybody else is that they, they, they want to do their own straw man definition. And then you can show one that from the textbooks, you know, from the, from the, the educational websites, you can show what the actual lessons are. These are what the actual definitions are. And they just simply reject it. So yeah. with, with Hovind, he says, he, he said it to you after he said it to me and he said it to, to hundreds of other people yep. and I'm sure everybody else has answered him. And he just refuses to accept the answer. He says, where does this new information come from? Yeah. Mutations. Here is a textbook on genetics, which I know you don't understand, but here's a textbook <laughs> on genetics. And this is what it says that mutations are the source of new information. And so he just rejects it. He says, that's not what the science is teaching. This is the science textbook. <laughs> here, here it is. It's, 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 like, here it is. it's right here. Yeah, no, and, and, Why would and, you expect geneticists to know genetics? <laughs> well, that's, that's the thing, Aaron. I mean, in, in creation and science, right? Um, so, you know, Everybody's a geologist. Everybody's a geneticist. Everybody's, you know, a, a biologist. They all do all of the jobs because obviously a PhD, uh, as it is for so many, this is kind of a, a mean dig, but as it is for so many sort of creation scientists, is is just a piece of paper to them. There is no work that goes into it in their mind, and therefore they don't lend expertise or credibility to people 
who have expertise and credibility. Which reminds me, speaking of that piece of paper, <laughs> right? so we have all of these different levels of science, all these different independent fields of study, completely unrelated to each other. You know, genetics has absolutely nothing to do with paleogeology. I mean, come on. So, so the unrelated, completely disparate things, I mean, and and uh, and the, the physics behind radiometric dating and all of this, and all of these overlap to show the exact same thing. And there's only one thing that doesn't agree with everything. Everything agrees with everything else, and they're all teaching the same story. And the only one and only thing that doesn't agree is the magic book of fables that says that snakes can talk. And 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 the thing the the thing that absolutely kills me about that too is that there are people out there who have devoted their entire lives to studying the Bible as an academic, like in academia as a text, and saying, okay, well, why does it say the things they, that it does? What did the culture look like? Why was it like this? Well, the reason there's a talking snake is because there were talking snakes in like three fourths of the origin stories that existed in the in the ancient Near East. You had to pop this with, with the Egyptians right there, the chaos snake. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but even within the own their own theology, right? I mean, you, you know, your pro, your your more progressive individuals are are cool with it, but we're talking specifically with, with evangelists, refuse to even consider that that humans are subject to the culture around them and that maybe just maybe <laughs> this stuff didn't literally happen. Well, here's, here's the thing that I want to try to point out when they, when they say you have the words of man versus the word of God. Well, the word of God, I think would be reality. It would be written in the rocks. It would be all the evidence that I actually have. If there was a God, then all of God's evidence would be my evidence. That's the stuff man can't reproduce. Man can't go out and bury all those fossils. Yeah. yeah. But you know what man can do? <laughs> man can lie. And we can write bullshit stories. And the Bible isn't the only one we've written. We've written a bunch of them. There's just some of them have fallen out of favor. And then when Gutenberg invented the, the, the printing press, well, then the Bible won out over everything else because it was the first book ever printed. And there you go. Right. And, you know, the the, the thing is with that, too, is that it, it really blows my mind how how we can look these same individuals, right? These, these same, same evangelical folks, right, can look at, you know, say, say that I don't know what the ancient or what the the holy text is for like Hindus, right? Where they've got, you know, Ganesha. And, there's, a, and, there's a library of okay. holy texts for the Hindus. <laughs> okay, so it's big. It's, it's stunning. It's big. They have, they have the Vedic scriptures. Okay. And then they have the uh, they have the, uh, the the Mahabharata, which is the world's longest epic poem. And just one chapter of the Mahabharata is the Bhagavad Gita. And and then there's a there's there's another whole collection of books and I'm not, on, on top of the Vedic scriptures and I can't remember what the name of that other book, but it, it's, it's not a book. It's a bunch of them. So Hinduism is the oldest religion and continuous practice. It way predates, right? It, it predates Judaism. It predates the oldest books of the Bible. I, I, yeah, I, I completely, I mean, I would completely buy that. I mean, you could, it does, do you know if it predates like the Epic of Gilgamesh as well? Does it? No, uh, no. The, the 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 Rig Veda uh, is the first books of the of the the the, uh, the Hindu library, okay. uh, and and I think that one is somewhere on the on the edge of, of like fifteen hundred uh, fifteen hundred BC. Yeah, I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, however, um, the, the the Epic of Gilgamesh is a full thousand years earlier than that. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's. Um... I, I don't think it might be cuneiform. I might be misremembering, but it, it's like chiseled into a tablet. Yes. The Mesopotamian mythology, a lot of it was in, okay. in cuneiform. Yeah. And most of the dates on those for the copies we have from Ashurbanipal's library yeah. are from roughly 1850 to 2350 BCE. Yeah. But the stories that they recount, some of them are much older than that. Yeah. So there's uh, the, the one that the, the Noah's flood is based on, for example, uh, is, is one that archaeologists have verified that the, the one and, and some historians will get persnickety that I can't prove 
that this is what this is. Mm. But if you if you compare a number of other sources like the like the Sumerian king list, for example, that talks about you get up to this this particular king and then the flood washed over. Right. So we have a particular time here. And then uh, this other document that talks about Ziasudra and how he was his he was washed out in a flood of the Euphrates that took his he was on a punting boat on a barge that has his livestock on it. He's taking it to market. And then the, the flood of the Euphrates washed him out into the Red Sea. And so this is there are so many parallels that I personally find it difficult not to interpret that this has got to be where the right. Noah's blood story came from. <laughs> well, mm. and, you know, and, and that, the, the, the reason I mentioned that was because of the date and it was, that was like 2900 BC. Right. Yeah. I mean, to, yeah, to the, the thought that I was thinking was just sort of like, I find it very interesting that you'll get evangelicals who, who sort of, ex they, they're, they're into this idea of a, a literal tree of life a uh, literal talking snake, a literal global flood, and then they point their fingers and laugh at at the deities of, of Hinduism because they find them ridiculous, you know? And and you kind of look at that and you're like, okay, you know, stones, glass houses, like let's, let's, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I had this, this so just kind of in the realm of the flood, right? And, and kind of along the same lines of archeology span and, and cultural anth stuff, but it's like, why do so many cultures have flood myths if, if Noah's Ark didn't happen? Because people live next to river deltas constantly and they always flood. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, one country, one, uh, one uh, area, <laughs> I, I couldn't call it a country at that time, uh, but it, Japan hmm. didn't have flood myths, despite hmm. the fact that they are regularly inundated by tsunamis, probably more so than anywhere else in the world. And so one theory about why they don't have a flood myth is because they don't need to make up a bullshit story like that. <laughs> it happens so often. We don't even joke about that, man. <laughs> They're like, no, nah, that's just weather. <laughs> that's just what happened. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So uh, I want to get back to... Things that you would advise somebody if they're going to be debating a creationist, because there was one last thing that I wanted to bring up, and then I'm just going to let you go. Uh, that, that's where Kent, Kent says that no fossil works because you can't prove that it had any babies. Mm. So if you find a jawbone and the, the teeth that you have on this jawbone and the shape of the jawbone indicates that this is a totally different species than has ever been discovered before. Do you know from that jawbone that it had a body attached to it? It's safe to say. Would it be reasonable to assume that it's not the only one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I so so to that same point, I want to add to that because I I marked that on my notes when I, when I was just taking notes on things that he said that I thought were, you know, bear repeating or that he feels bear repeating. And I think, you know, people need to have a, a, a ready answer for that. Yeah. It's like if a volcano erupted, you know, whatever, 20 miles from my house, let's say here in, in beautiful Indiana, <laughs> the, the hot spot for all the volcanoes. Um, and let's say 10 people at random are, are preserved perfectly. They aren't burned up by the ash or by the, um, by the uh, pyroclasts, whatever the, the big heat, what walls that basically come down, but they're buried perfectly. I what are the odds? There's appropriate, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. What are the odds, statistically speaking, that the 10 people are going to be representative of your typical run of the mill human without any, you know, strange deformities or bone issues or inbreeding or whatever? Well, in, in Indiana, the inbreeding might be a bit of a problem, but <clears throat> normally, in, in a normal population, it would be pretty safe to say that you're, you're probably going to get a decent amount of, of you're probably going to get an entire sample size out of 10 of, of regular old people. Because Kent also likes to say things like, well, you know, you how do you, or not Kent, creationists in general like to say, well, how do you know that these aren't just hi weird hybrids, you know, or, or um, deformities? Because then, then they'll show that a picture of, you know, a, a young man who's got like carpenter syndrome and he's got like a cone head going on. And he's like, they're like, well, how do you know that these aren't just preserved versions of that? It's like, because fossilization is really, really rare, actually, like, and unless there's some kind of local event and you get lucky, but, or an individual wanders into an environment and, and happens to, to get preserved and not scavenged. So statistically speaking, you're not going to get some weird malformed looking member of a population. What you're going to get is your typical member. 
So it's not going to be a hybrid, which means it is a part of a population. It has to be. And it's not going to be someone who's got issues, one, because if, if they had any kind of typical skeletal deformities, they'd probably be selected out before adulthood anyways. But even if they weren't, they would it would be very unlikely that that individual would be preserved. So so for those of you who, who move forward with this, just remember, like, stats is at play here, you know? And, and Kent really responds to analogies, so feel free to use that one. I, I think it's... Yeah, got to point out that Kent Hovind used to argue that Neanderthal was <laughs> just an, as in singular, individual, and old man with rickets. Doesn't matter that we've found hundreds of fossils of Neanderthals, men, women, and children, and, and their DNA, and their DNA shows three different races, or deems rather, of Neanderthal for Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, and uh, Western Asia. Oh, good God. With the rickets. <laughs> <laughs> because there was actually one Neanderthal fossil that had some deformity to it. I can't remember. One of the first ones ever found did have some kind of deformity, which was odd. But then I, you, you find all of these others that are consistently the same morphology over and over and over again. Right. And to speak to that, too, like before anybody out there kind of thinks, well, didn't you just say that it's unlikely that someone with an issue would be preserved? You'll notice that that strange and sort of odd man out individuals increase as you get more socially or rather more definitively pro-social animals um, who who live in groups because we we care for our old our elderly and our young and and that's just something that we do as as highly social animals um, which I find that very interesting that once we have the advent of like oh well you know Og over there is getting pretty old and and his arthritis is acting up let's drag him along on a sled that we've made of a couple of boar hides you know and you can do that because you've got that nice big brain and and those dexterous hands and you're ready to go. Um, but yeah, Kent does that. He also brings up the brow ridges still, which the, the late, great Bill Ludlow su superbly refuted. He said, okay, well, if brow ridges, because Kent used to argue that brow ridges were just a sign of getting old. Like when you get older, your brow ridges get more pronounced. Uh, whether he thinks they kept growing or not, I don't remember. But Bill said, um, and, and, you know, of course, Kent is saying that like the patriarchs, the brow ridges are very large because these people were living to be like 900 or whatever. And Bill was like, okay, but they don't grow when you get older. And Kent was like, yes, they do. Um, and Bill was like, okay, then how come like 99 year olds don't have larger brow ridges than like a 50 year old? And Kent was like, well, cause they're, they're not like 900. And he's like, well, we don't know of anybody who's ever lived to be 100. So how can you prove that? You know, and it was an excellent refutation. Um, also bring up the recent multicellularity paper from, from, February of 2019. Yeah, uh, he, he accepted that <laughs> as evidence and then argued, well, they didn't have this evidence when Darwin started treating it. Yeah, because they had different evidence. Right. That was, that was indicated because he Darwin didn't know what, gen, what genes were. Genetics hadn't been discovered, but he understood mechanisms of natural selection and, and uh, sexual selection and, and some certain things of the fossil record, which count as evidence. These are the facts that indicate this conclusion. So he was teaching that evidence not this new stuff from 200 years later. No, exactly. And and the thing is, is that that this is excellent for, for the specifics, right? I mean, just the thing is, is creationists have such a high bar for, for their, you know, they want to actually see evolution occurring in real time in animals with massive gestational periods. <laughs> so, and, they, and they reject it even when they get to see that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's microevolution, obviously, you know, that, that kills me. Um, but yeah, if you're anybody out there who, who's con planning on conversing with Kent, bring ask him if he's finally gotten around to reading that paper because he said he was going to look into it with with me. Um, ask him if you watched the videos because there's videos. It's it's a really 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 cool paper, um, and and also you know bring up the fact because Kent is, seems to, Kent seems to be under the the impression that to get to multicellularity it was a stepwise process cell by cell so that we had a, a single cellular organism and then a two cell <laughs> organism three four so on and so forth so so you can hammer that so in as well when you see social interactions like i mean there, there's a there's a video that i particularly like where there's a, a water buffalo calf hmm. that has been grabbed by a crocodile 
and then lions grab the, the calf and they pull it out of the water. They'll pull the crocodile out. Now the lions have faced the crocodile. The crocodile goes back in the water. And now the lions have got the calf. And so there's five lions that are going to kill this calf. And suddenly you have a hundred buffalo coming back to get their calf. Well, when you have social interactions, when you have a collaboration like that, it's not like, no, I can only have one person assist me. And then later we can have three people assist me. <laughs> 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 are we going to be a community or individuals? That's the choice here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's actually, that's a great example, you know, I mean, or, or any kind of like neural network, right? I mean, it's very, it's quite rare that you, that you have an organism with two neurons. Like that's what it's got. <laughs> <laughs> Just hitting the, pe playing pong back and forth with synapses. That, that video I was just mentioning, uh, by the way, um, uh, was, was it was a really amusing thing we, when you have these five lions and they're suddenly facing a hundred buffalo. Oh, I mean, God. facing as in close proximity. And then the lions start backing up like, you know what? I'm not hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love those. I love those moments when and of course, it's we're we're anthropomorphizing them. But I will say that at least in primatology, there's this interesting kind of, and I'm sure you know you see the same thing with with Anth, and you're taking some primate stuff now, anyways. But it's like saying that you anthropomorphize something is kind of an interesting deal with primates because a lot of the stuff that they do are kind of anthropocentric. Like a lot of the things that they do, you don't have to anthropomorphize them because that's just what they're doing. Um, but they're oh, they're masturbating just like a person. <laughs> <laughs> we can listen, listen. We can add bonobo penis fencing to the list of post-fall consequences because they do that all the time. <laughs> okay. Way, <laughs> way more than you would think. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, and, and don't look up cockfighting. <laughs> 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 for all those for all those good roosters out there, don't don't feed the industry. Just you know, if you look up bonobos, I'm sure you'll see it. <laughs> it's not that hard to find. It happens a lot. Um, there's speaking of kind of funny videos out there. There's this there's this gif of a chimp. Um, it's it's a, a, a zoo bound chimpanzee. It has nothing to do with penis fencing, thank God. But um, he's he's just kind thank of thank God. <laughs> 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 well, if it's all part of the plan, then you know. <laughs> so he's, he's he's just he's just walking along, right? And there's this raccoon that's found its way into the enclosure, and the raccoon strays too close to this chimpanzee who's just you know walking about, and the chimp just grabs it and yeets it like as far as it can, and the raccoon is just spinning like a boomerang, and and lands down at the other end of the enclosure, and the chimpanzee. Um, <laughs> just keeps on his merry way. And, and I kind of, I, I saw that and I was kind of like, that's, that's so like us, you know, you're, you're walking along the, the, the road and you see a rock and you just kick it just for the hell of it. And, and they just, they kind of do the same thing. I mean, you know, I saw that video by the way. I, I think it's really funny. <laughs> I felt very sorry for the poor raccoon. <laughs> well, and 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 the worst part is, as you can see, when he lands, another chimp is coming up to investigate. And and as we know, chimps are very they're very much like us. So it's not prob probably didn't end too well for that poor raccoon. It's not. It's there's also that other sad one where the raccoon tries to uh, wash the cotton candy, and then the cotton candy falls apart. You seen that one? I think so. I remember that was heartbreaking. <laughs> <laughs> And, and he looks up at the camera like, you know, they got the like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. D and before we, we we're gonna have to close it up here yeah. soon, but I want to make sure that we've covered the rest of your notes. Yeah. Um, last thing I would say when Kent inevitably brings up, can something get as big as an elephant, like say an elephant, um, bring up that 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 pressure doesn't just work in a unidirectional way like that. So, cause he'll, he'll usually use it with like a flea or like a dog. He'll say, can you get a flea as big as an elephant? Um, you know, my argument was, was can, can God make an animal as big as a whale? Yes. Can God make a dog the size of Texas? That's, and that, yes. And, and that's. You're that's, saying God can't make yeah. a dog the size of Texas. 
Yeah, that that is that is what yeah that is what he's arguing, and and the the crazy thing is is um it, it was kind of a it was kind of funny it, it was one of my more what what I thought was a better get in in our discussion but he was like can you can you ever get a you know a a whale as big as Texas or what some animal as big as Texas. And I was like, well, no, um, because it, there would be nothing for it to feed upon. There's no pressure great enough to get an animal that large. Um, you know, the biomechanics aside, there's nothing to sustain it. You know, so so he likes to take things to the extreme. So for those of you, you know, when when you're debating with him um, or grappling, whatever you want to call it, uh, just shooting the shit with him, um, just just keep in mind the the logistics behind what he's asking and also why he's asking it because it's very i found that they're very rarely kind of ingenuous questions like they're they're mostly intended to get you to admit that there's some kind of limitation um which yeah yeah he's not going to admit that he has a limitation because no. his god is unable yeah of course to not. make a dog the size of texas yeah of course not he he never will um so so and that yeah those are those are two ways to kind of go about it, I would say. I mean, that's that's all I've got. I, th I think that um, there is a litany of media out there that you can see Kent kind of getting his his uh, his butt handed to him by several different individuals <laughs> um, in, in any category you like. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've heard I've heard a bunch of people say that Kent Hovind has uh, has beaten all of his opponents, but I've seen several of his debates, you know, and um, I've never seen him win one. So if there's anybody that's that likes him and you're watching this video, put down in the comments a debate that Kent Hovind won and how we know that he won it. Mm -hmm. That's going to be important. It can't just be that you agree with him or you don't like the other person or whatever. And, and like so many of my critics, I didn't watch anything you said, but I know you're wrong. It, <laughs> give us how you know, or how we know that he won. Cause I've had this thing where we, we had a, we had a guy do this, this debate really. He, 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 he declared himself the winner uh, because one other Muslim said that he won. Hmm. And a hundred people said that he didn't know what he was talking about or that he was lying. Yeah. But the absolute true. consensus was that there was one person who already walked in believing that, never watched the rest of the debate, and just said that he won just because. So you're, you're always going to get that. My, mm. my, my first debate, there was one person in the room that said that my opponent won, and that was my opponent. <laughs> 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 he was alone. <laughs> and just before before we got off the stage, I made sure to get a show of hands from the audience. Hey, who who won this thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I knew, I knew that was going to be the thing because that's what it always is. Of course. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah. That's the thing. I mean, no one. <laughs> if if the uh, if there's one person in favor of the other debater, even if it's with that debater, then they may as you they just won the debate already. It's in their eyes, it's a done deal. You know, yep. that's, that's it. All right. Well, you got anything else that you want to tell people that are going to be debating these people, debating a professional creationist, other than you know, don't. <laughs> you know, you know, honestly, my my advice is my advice is if you get the opportunity and you can stomach it, always always take the time to to initially engage someone um, because you never know if that person is is going to be sort of a, a good faith actor or not. And at least with me, um, for the fact that I've ever reached one good faith actor and, and that conversation has resulted fruitfully um, was was good enough reason to engage to engage all the other ones. But it's not for everyone. Um, I have I, I get emails at least I want to say an average of at least two a week. Mm for the last 10 years. Oh my God. From people telling me that, that I changed their mind and thanking I, I probably, I think I got three today. That so is, that's awesome. Th that, that, that certainly keeps me going. Yeah. But, but even the greatest advocates that we have for reason and rationality are all former believers. So whoever you're talking to, no matter how batshit crazy they may be now, they're under a debilitating condition because it's mental conditioning that they now have to to bit to to get past. But they can, people do, mm. 
Mm. And they end up being better afterward. And they're embarrassed at who they were before, but look who they are now. Well, so that's, that's Matt Dillahoney. That's Seth Andrews. That's just about everybody I know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Josh, Josh, uh, Dr. Josh too. Um, he's, he's an excellent resource and he's got a lot of really interesting uh, things to say about, about his journey. And, you know, if it weren't for, if it, you know, I, I had this conversation with Shannon, with Shannon Q, I think it was Shannon Q. Um, but you never know which section of the journey that you're on for someone. Um, you, you, you might be that, that last one at the end, you know, you might be the, you might be the first person who says, Hey, maybe you should look into this a little bit more and, and kind of knocks that journey off. Or you might be somewhere in the middle, which is where most of us are. And that's the part where you just get frustrated and you say, look, man, like, <laughs> I, I don't know what else to tell you. If, if you're not going to, if you're not going to, you know, accept empirical results, like, like basic math, then, then I don't know what to tell you. If um, I have one criticism for your debate with Hoven, it was where you said that you respectfully disagree <laughs> that your position is a religious belief. He's lying specifically knowing that this is not a belief that it's not magical imagination spongebob he knows what the evidence is he knows at least what some of the evidence is yeah and that's just a game he's playing i would i would encourage nobody to say you know well i respectfully there's no reason to respect a convicted fraud for who's lying to you and lying about you i i think that's fair enough i mean you know I, the thing is is that i I'm, I know way less sort of about the, I mean, I do absolutely know enough to say <laughs> conventional science isn't a religion. Um, but I, I was so hoping to get sort of to, to more of the stuff and I could feel, I felt like it was almost a bait because he knows how much that, that really irritates those of us who just accept science for being science. That's why he throws it out. Yeah, that's why he does it. So, yeah. you know, I, I, what I should have said is no, Kent, I disagree, but let's change the subject. <laughs> I'm so, <laughs> yeah, I'm it, a pushover. I can't help it. Yeah. I, when I, when I'm saying this, this is a criticism. I realize that he's doing that to bait your response. And I'm telling you to give the response that he's asking you to bait. I don't actually want you to do that. I know that he does that just so that he can irritate people. Like the, when he began the debate with you by saying, well, you've been thoroughly indoctrinated, but yep. we can fix that. No, you can't fix shit because you don't know anything. Yeah. And we understand what evolution is. We're studying it. You know, to some degree, we're teaching it. We know it. There's nothing he can say that make us unknow. And it was, oh, wait, it didn't become a different kind. It would take blunt force trauma to the brain to, to, to convince me that he's right about anything at this point. So. Well, yeah, and, and especially because you'll notice at least in, in, in my conversation with him almost. And, and for those of you out there who do, cause it was the same thing with, with Aaron as well. Most of his responses will be analogies um, because he doesn't, he doesn't stay up to date on the literature at all period. So you won't get any, like, don't worry going in there that you're going to be blindsided by some new literature that you haven't read that came out two weeks ago because he's still working on the literature from 1981. So it's, it's like you can you can rest easy on that one, um, and and you know Kent Kent it Kent if you ever see this read some papers like it's it's just good practice if you know if you're gonna have a science debate about anything you have to read some papers it's so imperative. Um, but what even, I always wanted to see what I always and, and this is genuine this is sincere I would love to see uh, Kent Hovind debate uh, Jaronism, one of the flat Earth people. Oh my God. That would be great because the, the flat earth guys, they're all religious. No, Kent wants to say that it's a, that the flat earth movement is an atheist conspiracy, <laughs> but you're going to have, you're going to have fun trying to do that when all these people are diehard religious. And the only reason they believe in a flat earth is so that they can think they can vindicate God by, because science can't explain a flat earth and therefore God of the gaps, logical fallacy that proves God somehow. But anyway, if Kent were to debate, Somebody on the flat earth, like Jaronism, who who believes in God. Well, then, uh, the, the the atheist argument isn't going to work. Kent would actually have to use science for the first time in his life on a debate where he could actually win for the first time in his life if he could figure out how to do it. And I don't think he can. So he could probably realistically still lose. Oh, my God. Even I that debate 
<laughs> is, is, he re is he really calling Flat Earth an atheist conspiracy? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, that is that is a level that I I wasn't anticipating because I, it, it's funny that you bring that up because again in this in this chat I had with G-Man the other day, the, the thing about G-Man is I I will disagree with G-Man about literally probably everything. Um almost everything. But he isn't a flat earther and so at one point we at least got to stand in solidarity on that. And so James said, "G-Man, you know, would you like to date?" I think his name's Nathaniel Thompson. He's like a, a flat earth guy. And G-Man said, <laughs> No, I won't do that because I'm not going to engage such a silly idea. Or like it was something along those lines. And I kind of sat there and it was a moment for me you, where you I had to you had to process yeah. <laughs> that G Man just said that he was <laughs> and, and the thing is is it, it reflected, I think, on me more than anything else because I was like, well shit. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's kind of that's kind of what I. That being said, I I did have a blast with you. I wish I could watch that because I would like to root for G Man for something. He he he's very he's a charismatic guy. You can you can give him that. Um, for for for. So I I can't. I haven't had a I haven't had a remotely productive conversation with him ever. Yeah. And the the, the first time, or what I thought was the first time, apparently I had talked to him before, but I didn't remember talking to him before, and he apparently got really angry that I didn't remember talking to him before. <laughs> it sounds like but, <laughs> Yeah. Well, anyway, I, I thought you, I literally thought you can't be serious. I thought this has got to be, he's got to be a Poe. He's got to be joking. There's no way anybody could, but no, he was completely off the chain. Yeah. He's just, yeah. yeah. G, G man doesn't really care for the, he, and he has said this, uh, he said this to me like two nights ago. He was like, he's not really into like the whole science of it. <laughs> Um, and, and I was kind of like, why are we having this conversation? Um, but I, I had heard prior to chatting with him that, that he can be quite vitriolic in conversation. So I was kind of like, oh man, what have I gotten myself into? Um, but I guess I caught him on a good day. <laughs> it would seem so. <laughs> yeah. I, I that, I've been told that by a couple of different people who were like, damn, that, you know, usually he's not that, he's not that, uh tolerable. <laughs> but, but And one last, I, I've tried not to ask this question but I, my curiosity is taking over. Yeah, Gut sure. sick Gibbon? Yeah, okay. So I, I wasn't anticipate. I really wasn't anticipating on, on actually, you know, getting as much success, I guess, as I have gotten on YouTube, which, you know, I, I, I can't believe people enjoy what I put out, which I, it's very awesome. I love it. It gives me an excuse to get on camera and talk about things that very few people in my real life circle want to hear about, which is like the Ediacaran or, or how, how cool Artipithecus is or, or whatever. Um, but I, I, in my free time, I, I do a lot of doodling. So on my, in my videos, I, they have a lot of cartoons in them because I like cartoons. And um, before I ever came up, the day I actually made a YouTube channel, I, I was, um, or it was actually, it's, it's a red, it's an old Reddit username because I used to spend a lot of time on debate evolution being one of the those who is it, debate evolution subreddit is basically everyone there accepts evolution and the new people who come in to fight about evolution get met with uh, the, the entire army of those of us who, who are cool with it but the day i made that reddit username i doodled this little gibbon um who like had an upset stomach so he was like drinking he had like a little tea in his in his hands um and it was like colored on my on my sort of uh, drawing pad, my Wacom drawing pad. And, and I really liked it. And I had it as my avatar on a lot of social media after that for some time. So when I'd made that Reddit account, I was like, oh, you know, like he's, he's very, he's quite sickly. He's like a gut sick gibbon. You know, like one can be heart sick. This is, this is a, a gut sick gibbon. Um, and, and it was, I just pulled it out of my ass completely because it's not a good username. And so I, <laughs> I put it on there and, and then I started, it kind of grew on me, you know, as, as things that you start off not liking very much tend to. Um, and, and I kind of got a, a, a reputation on that site for that being my username. So when I made my YouTube channel, I wanted them to recognize that this was the same person because that's what I'd gone to. So, um, so I made it my, my, my YouTube name. And then I made that little blue gibbon, my, my sort of mascot. And that is the not very interesting story of where that username comes from. It's not a good story. Every time someone asks me, I wish I could say I had a better one, but but the truth is, is it's just a cartoon that I made up and, and I liked it. And so it stuck. 
<laughs> I had a moment to come up with a username for Usenet, and my name is already Aaron. Uh, I thought Amen Ra was the was a template that they based the God of Western monotheism on. Right, right. So I wanted to give a nod to that, so I called myself Aaron Ra. And it stuck. I had no idea that I would end up having to legally change my name. <laughs> <laughs> What's it, Aaron? I don't have that luxury. <laughs> I don't think I. I don't think I have that luxury. Um, which would you know? I mean, and and that's when I first signed up to have this debate with Kent. I was like, I can't go on there. I can't go on this debate that other people are going to see. You know, my channel had like two hundred subscribers at that time. I was like, I can't go on there and be like, Hi, my my name's Gutsick Gibbon. So <laughs> It's not the worst I've heard. It's not great, but if you can say it, it's not great. But but you know that's why I'll be like, "Hi, I'm Erica, also known as Got Sick Given on YouTube." <laughs> okay, well it, it'll save you a like a great deal of money having to change your name and <laughs> Fair enough. all that. Fair enough. All right, I'm gonna have to let you go. Uh, if you yep. want me to share any links. Uh, with anybody that 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 you know for your channel for your whatever. Um, Please I let you know share them with me so that I can put them in the link below. Yeah, yeah. I will um I'll just I mean you have my channel link, um, and then I'll send you to uh that that summary on there. It's this listen, you're if you if you have time, you're gonna want to go through this blog. It's 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 got that AIG guy, Nathaniel Jensen, geneticist. And this guy, this evolutionary biologist, just absolutely does a, a page by page, essentially teardown of, of the entire thing. Um, so I'll, I'll 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 give that as well for those of you out there who want to see something that's a little bit more in depth as far as people out there who are who are critiquing um, who are critiquing the, the technical literature of creationists. Um, and then, yeah, I think I, I think that's it. I don't think I have anything else. All right, thank you very much. Got sick, Gibbon. <laughs> Thanks for. Me <laughs> <laughs> oh man.